以修建一种一种方式。我这里也可以中国梦或者技术，原来的五百年的梦。一九二六年，福建。From an educational standpoint, I heard a diplomat、uh, from China say this, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Twenty years from now, or thirty years from now, or forty or fifty years from now, the possibility exists that you could have a leader in China and the leader of the United States who went to the same alma mater. Because you have so many students from、yeah. here, and you know, you were talking about one of the students from、uh, here going to Harvard. Give me your thoughts on that, and and、uh, and how does that change the dynamic of the world if that ever happens? Well, I think that would be great if we could get a Chinese president. I went to university in the West.、Um, I think it'd also be helpful if we had some American presidents that <laughs> had some education in China as well, and perhaps even more in some <laughs>、yeah. respects, right? Yeah, and and I think it'd have a very big influence. For example, some of the CEOs of countries like、uh, Simcoe, Ricardo Simler in Brazil, and he went to Harvard, and that gave him a totally different perspective. And he went back and transformed the company in Brazil. I think that. I think there's China and America both have a lot to learn from each other, and I think having a student of education in the U.S. would be very helpful for China. But I think it would be useful for the U.S. as well. Let me ask you about education, because you, as an educator,、uh, you, I think this is rather unique, decided you were going to educate your children on China by driving all around China、yeah. and educate them about the United States and Canada about、mm -hmm. driving. But probably you also learned. Talk to me about that experience of doing that. Here and there, and what were the takeaways? Yeah, well, I, I loved it. I'm not sure if my kids are totally keen on it, but I, when I drove around China, three months to do the 40,000 Tibet, Gobi Desert, all that. Beforehand, I took a ton of books, bookcases in the van, and and read about the history and the culture, and also understand some of the economic issues. And it was fascinating to me to go to these places and then read about it while I'm there.、Uh, but. It, But then, I,、uh, living in China gave me a greater appreciation for the U.S. as well. I looked at the U.S. from a different perspective, good and bad. So when I went back to the U.S., 40,000 miles around the U.S. and Canada,、um, I learned a lot of things I just never thought about when I lived in, in America. With so much change happening in China, Bill is also seeing a change in how his students think about their future. You've been a professor for some time, so talk to me about education, because、uh, you've seen both sides,、uh, the West and the East. And, and you're, you're very candid in your book.、Uh -huh. There are certain things about the East you like. There are certain things about the West you like. There should, and as you said, it's not black and white; it's gray.、Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about what the differences are as you see them. I was really frustrated with my students.、Um, Confucius, he said, "If I show you one corner, you should be able to figure out the other three corners, or I'm not going to explain it again." So he emphasizes case methods, you know, and creativity. But my students, I would give them A and C, and they couldn't figure out B in between. I mean, they just wanted me to tell them everything, lecture, and then they would like rote memorize it, and it's like it's very frustrating. Over time, I found out if I really push them, that they could figure this stuff out, they could do it. But I was really concerned. It's no creativity, it seemed like.、Uh, Later, I found out the U.S. has the same problem. Children learn to fear failure by the time they're seven, and China as well, and so it kind of crushes them. I remember when I was six years old, I read a sentence in English incorrectly before the class. I read the word "enough" as "enough," and some student, and I still remember, I was six years old, and I felt crushed. So, so there was a problem with this creativity. So, but then in the West, we emphasize creativity, but then you have things like only forty-some percent of twelfth graders can pass a fifth-grade ex math exam. So I think they have creativity, but no foundation. The Gaokao is China's notoriously tough university entrance exam. Every year, this single test determines the fate of 10 million Chinese students. Children start preparing for the Gaokao as early as kindergarten. The exam has spawned a $120 billion after-school tutoring and cram school industry in China. Stakes are high. Only one percent of test takers will make it to the top universities, and one in five will not be accepted to any university at all. The exam has been criticized for putting too much pressure on students and disregarding critical thinking. 
you mentioned the Gao Cow, and there's been a lot written about it, the pros and the cons. Um, one of my colleagues, we were uh, driving the other day, and her brother's in high school, and she said, oh, he's starting to prepare for this. And I said, it's kind of stressful, isn't it? Extremely stressful. Talk to me about uh, the Gao Cow, the pros, the cons, uh, and just the importance of it. Well, it's pros and cons, but it's also very hard to change. Um, in, in Shaman, we have MBA kindergartens. I mean, from the, that's what they call them, from the time the kids are small. I remember kids in the nursery when they're two years old already prepping them for kindergarten, and kindergarten's already prepping them for first grade. And first grade, they're already talking about the college entrance exam. First grade, they're six years old, and they have homework seven days a week, you know, school and homework 12 hours a day. I mean, goodness, when they're six years old. I built a tree house for my son. I remember, and everybody complained because they said in another eight or ten years they'll be grown up and won't use it. And if you build that, they won't play. I thought, oh my goodness. Uh, so these kids, there's such a strict um, regime. And, and our, our son's piano teacher, she wanted to teach her own son when he's seven years old how to play piano. She's a piano teacher. But she didn't dare because she was afraid if he spent half an hour a day studying piano, he wouldn't do well in the college entrance exam. So. Summer, she'd give him some, but not the rest. And I thought, that is sad. I mean, you know, if I have a class of 60 Chinese and 10 foreigners, I often have mixed classes. How many of you play guitar? Out of 60 Chinese, maybe one out of the foreigners, three or four out of 10. I mean, very few, very few hobbies. Like, now, it's changing now. It's getting more now. But it's still, it's such pressure because in, parents count on their children going to college. That's their future, but only one child. Or now more. There will be more now. But... So it's such pressure for the students, but how do you change it? The government for over 20 years has been talking about how to change this, and if they try to lessen the load, cut back on the school, cut back on the homework, some have done that, but then the students do score less on the Gaokao or the annual exams, and then the parents are angry because their students in that school scored less than the others. So it's really a catch-22. How do you solve it unless the whole country simultaneously everywhere does it? And they tried that, but then some schools cheat. You know, still have their students working around the clock. It's very difficult. Uh, I don't know how to solve it. It, it. One of the things you also talk about in your book is electives. Uh, just don't, uh, why would you take electives? You know, I mean, that, that whole, it, yeah. it gets kind of to the heart of your treehouse. Why would you let your kid play? But there's a benefit in taking They told electives. me, they said, we do have electives, but they're mandatory electives. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, why take electives? Students want them. Uh, and some of my students, and, I, and in the early years I had students come over and I taught them guitar or taught them to juggle or things like this. But, but it's changing now. Now more and more people are saying this is enough. I mean, you know, they, the thing is, is they were struggling. It was such a difficult time 30 years ago. And, and the biggest, people say, what's the biggest change in shaman? And to me, the biggest change in shaman is not the skyscrapers and the gardens and parks, because I think if you have money, you can build anything. I look at Dubai pile of sand and <laughs> they just poured money into it. But the spirit of the people now, they, now they have some optimism, some hope and excitement. But 30 years ago, they didn't have that. And I think it's because they saw the magnitude of the problem, 1.3 billion people. Um, I think they, like me, thought it's going to take 60, 70 years to fix this and then they, in their own lives, they're not going to see this. So their only hope is to really double down on that education, which throughout history has been a big thing, but more so now. Now they're seeing they're not going to starve. China's doing well. I think they're thinking they should be allowed to enjoy life more now. And there's pressure, there's emphasis, a lot of cultural emphasis. You know, the government has emphasized it, schools emphasize it, a lot of activities and events and things trying to emphasize quality of life, and culture and arts, all these things. But it's not easy. <laughs> but they're making an effort. The Gaokao aims to be a meritocratic system. It's a tough test for everyone and gives the chance for someone from a poorer region to go to an elite school. Well, the thing is, I have books. I've spent tens of thousands collecting books written by foreigners about China 100 or 200 years ago because they really researched China and understood it well. They wrote things Chinese didn't write back then. And these people wrote for centuries, Chinese have viewed education as the way to achieve, and you know, the imperial exam for 2,000 years, and even a, well, in, a, in my area, there's children in very poor areas of Fujian, Anxi, Huto, Longyan, very poor in the middle of nowhere, but they studied and became prime minister. And uh, so it's an amazing system. There's nowhere on earth where a country 
has had this kind of meritocracy. If you can get education, you can run the country. And, uh, and some people criticize and say, well, the poor people didn't have a chance. Well, it was harder for them. Even today, it's harder. But even then, some poor villages have pulled their funds to help the child that showed, you know, showed some promise. Or sometimes a rich Chinese would help a child like that. And uh, that's pretty amazing. And the Western government was influenced by that. I was surprised to find that India, the British in India in the 1830s adopted the imperial exam system for civil servants in India. And then they adopted it in UK. And 2013, I think it was, BBC said the imperial exam is a forerunner of all modern recruiting practices. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. In 2015, a British school launched an experimental program to bring in five Chinese teachers to instruct 50 teenagers using traditional Chinese methods. Teachers emphasized discipline and whole class learning, and students logged 12 hours daily of lessons and studies. The results, students in the experiment scored about 10% higher on math and science exams than their counterparts. I want to close with how you closed your book, um, and it's from uh, Bertrand Russell, Bertrand Russell. Uh, I love The Problem of China, written in 1922, and I want to see if 1922 squares with uh, 2019. So let me just read a couple of passages, and I'll, uh, and I'll ask you to kind of react. When I went to China, I went to teach, but every day that I stayed, I thought less and less of what I had to teach them and more of what I had to learn from them. True for you? Well. I came to learn because I came to study Chinese, but I only studied one semester. Then I became a teacher. And then I thought, well, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching. And I thought I had something to teach, but it is true. The more I'm here, the longer I'm here, the more I'm learning myself. I tell my students, beginning of every semester, we're hu shang shui shi, we're learning from each other. And I, it is amazing. And I think the world needs to learn from China as well. Among Europeans who lived a long time in China, I found this attitude not uncommon. But among those who stay is short or who go only to make money, it sadly is rare. Do you think that's true too? That people who just scratch the surface don't really understand China, somebody who's immersed like you does? A uh, hundred years ago, a foreigner wrote a book in, in Beijing and he said the only people that claim to understand China are globetrotters and journalists. <laughs> uh, but, and others have said, you know, you're in China a month, and I was this initially, after a month or two here, I, you know, I wrote these letters, I thought I could write a book about China. Uh, and after 10 years, people wanted me to write this book I've written, compile my letters and write a book. One artist even gave me a drawing for the cover, you know. But by then I was beginning to think, I don't really know this place. By 20 years, I thought I'll never write a book. By the time they asked me to write this, I'd given up. I said, yeah, I, I, who can understand? People say I'm Zhongguo Tong, I understand China. I said, nonsense. I said, not even Chinese understand China. It's too big and changing too fast. Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's amazing. So I, the longer I'm here, the more I learn. If you were to leave one final message for our viewers, what might it be about China? I mean, we talked a little bit about the misconceptions, um, just how if, if you view China through the Western prism, a lot of time it's negative. Uh, well, what, what would you like to leave our viewers with? In well, terms a, of a quote, I wish I had it in front of me to quote it, but 1919, a man named Gamewell wrote a book. I have all these hundreds of old books these foreigners wrote. And he wrote that ancient Egypt was great, but its greatness is past. You know, Rome is great, but it's, today it's just a city. It's not like it was. But he said, China lives on. It's still great after all these thousands of years. But he said, there's a new life, a new vitality in this nation. Like 100 years ago, 1919. New life and new vitality. And the greatest is yet ahead. And I was amazed he wrote that a hundred years ago. Sadly, then we had World War I, World War II, all these problems, and so a lot of suffering after that. But now I feel like hopefully the greatest is ahead. I hope we've learned something in the world today about how to peacefully coexist. I hope China's, I think China's learned a lot from the world, and I hope the world has learned something from China as well. And so I really do hope that what he wrote a hundred years ago is true today. The greatest is yet ahead, not just for China, but for the rest of us. That's a great way to end. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's great to meet you. Fantastic.